things work out well and happily. And when we imitate Krishna, then it's a tragedy. It's horrible. Because we can't imitate Krishna. Who can imitate Krishna? Huh? I mean, who, who has enough money to have so many diamonds and gold ornaments and servants to dress him and people to cook for him and people to make palaces for him? I mean, who has that much money? Huh? Even if you did, you wouldn't be able to find people with enough talent to do these things nicely. Huh? And even if you could, you couldn't find people who had the talent and could do it and, and would also love you. <laughs> They'd be envious instead. Oh, he has so much money. You know? Let's steal some of the jewels. See, this, you can't imitate Krishna. You can try, but it always winds up badly. <laughs> It's always a disaster because Krishna is Krishna. You know, Krishna is unique. Only Krishna has complete freedom. Only Krishna has complete power or complete wealth or any of the opulences. Everybody else is just some little tiny reflection or imitation of Krishna. You can't imitate Krishna. And if you try, you just get a lot of suffering. Another question? A very simple one. Uh, in the ideal commune, we would raise cows just for milk and to please Krishna, but if cow is supposed to give milk, it has to have a calf every year. What do we do with the bull? Well, we don't have them, we don't let the cows have a calf every year, usually like every two years or even three years. Because once a, once a cow is fresh, um, by skillful management, you can, the milk will last a year and a half, maybe. Huh? And then you let her rest for a while and then get pregnant again. And then the other point is that uh, the bulls are made into oxen and used to pull tractors, or instead of tractors, to pull uh, plows and carts and haul stuff. And I mean, bulls are very strong. They can effortlessly haul stuff around. Um, we see them around here in Chile. We have to take some videos. We have to go out and show people what's here. We haven't even really, um, we've been so busy just getting set up and everything, and now we're almost finished. Huh? Just a little bit more repairs on our truck, and we'll be able to go anywhere. And, uh, we we want to take videos of the culture here because the ox training is still very much alive. And uh, these oxen, I mean, they do everything. They plow, they haul, they pull, they pull your car out of the ditch when it gets stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they pull the logs down out of the, out of the forest when they cut trees. They do so much hard work. I mean, bulls are really wonderful. So if we run out of oil and all the cars stop working or it becomes so expensive that it's only, you know, you, you only have like public transportation. You don't have any private vehicles anymore. What are people going to do to get work done? Oxen. Huh? They're much better to work with than horses. You know, horses, even draft horses, they still like to run. They're built to run. Uh, but you can't run if you're, hold, if you're hauling a cart or if you're uh, plowing or something like that. You need low gear, you know? You need a high torque, low gear. <laughs> That's an ox. It's a perfect description of ox. Oxen or cows in general don't like to run. They like to walk one step at a time, take their time, you know, like that. They're very social animals. They always like to be in pairs, at least, or, you know, some group. Uh, so oxen are always yoked in pair. And as long as you train them all the same way, you know, they can work together even in bigger groups like that. So, um, yeah, they're better than, 
horses better than mules, much better than burros. <laughs> uh, there's, yeah, unlimited need for oxen. They, they earn their keep. They earn their grass. Since we were discussing Krishna's appearance, I was opening from Tio. Since we were discussion, discussing Krishna's appearance, I was so curious as to why he is so often depicted in blue colors. Is there a spiritual significance or symbolism behind this? No symbolism. No, we don't have symbolism. Uh, Krishna is blue, that's his color. He's actually the color of a fresh rain cloud. Uh, sort of a bluish gray, dark kind of bluish gray color. Krishna's body is completely spiritual. It's not an ordinary body, you know, like meat and bones and stuff like that. Krishna's body is eternal and transcendental. It never decays. It never gets old. Uh, not a, it's not an ordinary biological body. Krishna is, is not conceived in the ordinary way by seminal injection within the womb of the mother. Uh, if you read Krishna book, or Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna first appeared within the mind of Nanda Maharaj, or sorry, of uh, Vasudeva. And then he transferred from the mind of Vasudeva to the heart of Devaki. And then when the time was right, he appeared from her womb. It doesn't say that he was born. It doesn't say that she went into labor. It doesn't say that they had sex. Huh? It says that he appeared in the mind of Vasudev and then was transferred to the heart of Devaki. Then he appeared from her womb in the fullness of time. Huh? So try to understand. Krishna does not appear by the usual biological process of seminal injection. He appears by his own sweet will. He can appear and disappear anywhere in a moment. Huh? He can travel faster than the mind. He can go anywhere. And he can even appear in multiple forms and multiple locations and do different things in each place. Krishna is amazing. Krishna has unlimited potential, unlimited power. Huh? Just try to understand Krishna. You're so new. <laughs> it's like all these questions are like baby questions. <laughs> um, try to understand Krishna. Krishna is like, he's beyond everything. Uh, Krishna is the original source of everything. So instead of thinking of Krishna as someone who appears within the universe, try to understand the universe as something that appears within Krishna. And then maybe you have a better conception of what's really going on. Krishna is like the sky, and this universe is like a cloud that appears in the sky. Huh? And then Krishna, if he likes, he can appear within the cloud too. See, he's within and without at the same time. He's greater than the greatest and smaller than the smallest at the same time. He's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, independent and full in everything. And at the same time, he's dependent on his devotee. He becomes dependent on his devotee, like Nanda Maharaj. Huh? Try to understand, Krishna is everything to everyone. Huh? Krishna is, and, and, and he's beyond that. There's whole areas of Krishna's personality that we jiva souls are absolutely incapable of understanding. Huh? Whole dimensions where we can't even go, where that, that are his alone. Huh? We can't understand, for example, his relationship with Radharani, his Shakti, his supreme Shakti. We can't understand his relationship with Lord Shiva, huh? who is the expansion of the expansion of the expansion of his personal uh, plenary portion, Balaram. Uh, 
Huh? He is the, the Lord and he's not the Lord at the same time. I mean, there's so many things about Krishna that are so inconceivable, so far out, so completely esoteric. Uh, if you try to understand him using ordinary logic or ordinary intelligence, you will fail every single time. Kanai is over there shaking his head. <laughs> yeah, if we, at first, the best thing is to simply listen. Simply hear and try to absorb. Huh? Then once you have duplicated the information, then you try to start thinking through it on your own and seeing if you can come up with the similar conclusions. Huh? And what I always tell my students is 